these uh, pyramids here, what's these pyramids here? The Giza. The Giza Plateau connects with the Agazi. The people from the first time. Right? The first people. Our ancient ancestors. Right? The first God. Igaziabeher. Right? Gutiz. Gaza. Giza. Right? The Giza Plateau. In Isaiah Tinbete Sias, we have the evidence in the Hebrew scrolls that confound this false narrative that we have been forced to accept and some still argue with the ghost of white supremacy. You know, they're arguing with the ghost of white supremacy in their COINTEL pro black consciousness. You know, the Egyptians or the black Kemetans, right? Versus the, the Bible versus the Israelites, the Hebrews, when they really don't even understand or acknowledge the true meaning or reason that this, right, this is on the back of the American dollar bill, right? It's not because America is Egypt in that sense, but that keeps the Hebrews who are the, the um, what are they call the black oil, the black gold, right? The Hebrews are the black gold. Mm -hmm. They keep, let's keep the black gold in check, right? And that's why it's put on a on the back of the one dollar bill, and this is why they call this one dollar bill, right? And notice that's B right there. Notice that's New York, New York. It's a hell of a town, right? So great they got to name it twice. Why B? Because that's Babylon, right? That's Babylon. So this is the greatest, right? Damning the true God spell, right? That has ever been. Um, created this is this is this is the ultimate level of sorcery and witchcraft right here. Yeah, on the back of the dollar bill. But what's the root of it? You see, this is the root of it. Egypt is the root of it, right? And my people do not know who they be because they're still arguing with the ghost of white supremacy, right? In the in the Kemetin versus the Black Hebrews and the Black Hebrews versus the Kemetin. And both of them being afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation and of Egypt, their glory. Well, the Kemetans have this for them. The black, the black consciousness community that's into Egypt have this for them. They're not so much, you know, ashamed of Egypt, the glory of Egypt. They have half the story right, right? So they have they have a little bit more than many of the black Hebrews, which we rebuke vigorously because they have gone away from the black Hebrew patriarchs, such as Rabbi Wentworth, Arthur Matthews, and those who through blood, sweat, and tears laid that foundation for the true Ethiopian Hebrew consciousness, which is the Messiah consciousness, the black Messiah consciousness, the true Christ consciousness. Verse 19, Isaiah 19, 19, in that day, there shall be an altar to Adonai, Adonai, to Yahweh, he who be who he be, in the Hebrew, his divine majesty, Rastafari, in the midst of the land of Egypt. You do know that the Gaza Plateau is the midst, is the middle of the earth. Science has already proven what the ancients already knew thousands of years and what Tinbete Isaias, the prophet Yeshayahu, the prophet Isaiah, writes here in Isaiah 19, 19. How often have they cited this? What's the interpretation of this? How can Yahweh say that, well, he has an altar, an altar, an altar to, to Adoni, to Adonai, to Yahweh, to Jah? In the midst of the land of Egypt. How is it? Does he have an altar in the midst? I thought the Egyptians were a bunch of pagans and heathen and all of them were idol worshippers. That's because we've received a, a, a false, a counterfeit, a, 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 a Eurocentric Jewish fables, white Jewish fables, um, which was all to justify the enslavement of Jah's people, right? Of Jah's people. So let's get through this right here. And it, the same verse, verse 19, and a pillar. 
at the border thereof to Adonai. Is that one of the obelisks that they took? They, well, they took a lot of the obelisks. Think about that for me. That's what a pillar is. A pillar is an obelisk. And where do they have these obelisks? In all of their capital Gentile cities. In all of their Canaanitish cities. In Europe. In England. In America. They have obelisks. Right? Uncircumcised Egyptian obelisk. And I'll point out why I say that. Because they're not in the style of the of the Hebrew obelisk. When we look at the, the obelisk or the stellas, the howlets of ancient Ethiopia, we find the Hebrew because that's where that remnant grew. That remnant grew. That's why Yahweh says in Amos 9 and 7, Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Is? Rael. So it says, in, the, in that day, in that day there shall be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt. Remember the Israelites, they were in the southern delta region. That's not the midst of the land. So some might say, oh, that was the Hebrews. No, it's not speaking of that. It's saying an altar. Now, why is this an altar? Because how many pyramids we see here? Well, not including the, the, the queen's pyramids, but the male pyramids, the three large ones, we have three pyramids here, right? The, those pyramids are for Selassie, or for the triune God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what those three pyramids are for. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, the pillar that was at the border thereof to Adonai, to Yahweh, is interesting because... Those are the pillars or the obelisk that have been stolen from Egypt. Many of them have been stolen and put in all the cap in Rome. They got one in Rome and then they put their symbology to lock it down. Why are they taking this symbology? Right? Why are they using this symbology? Another important point is that when we look at Daniel's prophecy in the end times, the beast kingdom, it does not include Egypt. Right? It does not include Egypt, but it says, and it shall be for a sign and for a witness to Adonai Sebaot, to the Lord, the black Lord of, of, of hosts in the land of Egypt. So this is a sign and a witness. Isn't it interesting? A sign and a witness. So we have the king's pyramids three and the queen's pyramids three. Right. And on November 2nd, his majesty was coronated. Right. As the conquering line, the tribe of Judah. Hala Selassie first. Kedamawi Hala Selassie. Suyumek Ziavia. Elect of the first God. Negusa Neges Ze Ethiopia. King of kings of Ethiopia. And his queen. Right. Etege Menin. Kedamawi Walete Georgis was crown that very same day. So we, we see this, this, this principle, right? This principle in manifestation and revelation in the coming of the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings, Kedemar, Wehala, Selassie. For they shall cry to Adonai because of oppressors or downpressors. Ja, Rastafari. And he shall send them a savior and a great one. And he shall deliver them. And Adonai shall be known to Egypt. Right? Adonai was known. Selassie has been known to Egypt. And what Egypt are we speaking of? Right? We're speaking of Illuminati Egypt. Right? We're speaking of the prophetic Egypt. Known to Egypt. Because this symbol came on the dollar bill. Not from 1776. Even though it says... M-D-C-C-L-X-X-V-I, which is 1776 in Roman um, letter numerals, right? Um, but he's no, this was put on the dollar bill at, I think, 1933, when America went into bankruptcy, right? Three years after the crowning of the King of Kings, of Haile Selassie, all right? So they're known, known to, known to... Right, he is, shall be known. Right, he shall be known. Selassie I shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know Selassie I, Adonai, Adonai, 
John Rastafari in that day and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow to Adonai and perform it. Now, this is another important point I wanted to make known, and we're going to get back into this, forward into this video. Another important point, it's like, although we might be called Americans, right? Those of us Rastafari who are called Yankees as opposed to Yardies on that level, right? So be it. You understand? But let's just look at the big picture, the vision of the King of Kings, that we might be Americans, but we're Hebrews. You see what I'm saying? So when it's advantageous, we might say, yes, I'm American, right? As Clark said, if anything is good that we can get, you said under those those so-called pseudo titles, so be it. But we should never buy into the lie. So the Israelites, right, had Egyptian citizenship. They were Egyptians. Joseph, Yosef, Ayusif, right? Ayu, the Seth, he, he was Egyptian, right? Or could pass for an Egyptian, right? An Egyptian. So we see the same kind of a thing, right? Even in our history and in our experience here in the diaspora. And Adonai shall smite Egypt and he shall smite and heal it. This is interesting. He shall heal it. And they shall return even to Adonai. So here in the Hebrew scriptures, Yahweh says, yes, he's going to smite ancient Egypt if we interpret it in the context of ancient Egypt, but he will heal it. And they shall return even to Adonai. And he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. So we have great hope for our Kemetan community. But we have to point out this COINTEL Pro, right? COINTEL Pro Black Consciousness, right? Where we are divided from ourselves because we're still arguing with the ghost of white supremacy. Right. And not being able to interpret this rightly. Right. Because when we interpret it rightly, we'll see the way out to come out of Babylon. In that day, verse 23, shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. You know, Assyria is in the news. Very interesting. And the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. Now, what's important about Assyria is the whole Nimrod part of it. We're not going to get much into it right now, right? The Nimrod part of it. And this is how the black presence in ancient times we and, and, the, and the Egyptian influence in the ancient um, Babylonian pre- and post-Babylonian kingdoms came about. So when we have Abraham coming out of there, right? Abraham was a black man. See, this is how we have to recognize that Nimrod went over there to put down the Canaanite and the reptilian agenda, right? He got caught up somewhat. And from being progressive, like a kind of a Marcus Garvey, he became retrogressive, right? Retrogressive. But we'll touch on that as well. In that day, shall Israel be the third with Gibbets, uh, with Egypt and with uh, Syria, Assyria, even a blessing, a barakat in the midst of the land. So I find it very interesting in the news presently, Assyria has been in the news a lot, Syria, 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 in that region of the world, right? Because something they're trying to put down over there, because as it says in verse 23, in that day, shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians and that day shall Israel be the third. So we once again see this Trinity and remember this is in the same chapter where it's talking about the altar right to Adonai, the altar to Yahweh, he who be who he be, his divine majesty, Kedemawi Hala Selassie and we see this these three pyramids, the three male pyramids, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can now see the context of what's written here in Isaiah in the prophets. Now, verse 25 to complete the chapter here says, Whom Adonai Sabaoth shall bless. He shall bless them. 
saying, now I want, I want you to get this, bless be Egypt, my people. And all this talk you've been hearing about what the Bible and Egypt and the Exodus and oh, the white man says this and they're black people and it didn't happen, it's a myth. Another point, it, it's a myth, but it's a reality. It's a myth and a reality. But the myth it only becomes a reality with the chosen people, with the people, right, that in the King of Kings and through his Christ, loose those seven seals and rise to the highest degree and come out of the Babylonian um, matrix, as it were. Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. So Israel is Yahweh's, is Jah, Rastafari's inheritance, right? Yet, notice what it says in this chapter 25, Isaiah 19:25. Whom the Lord of hosts, Adonai or Adonai Sebaot, Yahweh Sebaot, Yahweh of hosts, shall bless. Right? Whom Kedamawi Hala Selassie, the first power of the Trinity, the Adonai of hosts, Selassie, right, shall bless, saying, Bless be Egypt, my people. So see why it was so important for them to say, yeah, they look like they're black in the complexion, or like they're your complexion, but they're not black people. They're, they're tan Europeans or something like that. They're white people. They're white Egyptians. All this nonsense, right? It's basically nonsense. and need to be dismissed as nonsense, like excrement. You don't keep it around in the house. You put it out, right? So we have to put that out of our consciousness, he says that he shall bless, right? He shall bless Egypt. He said, blessed be Egypt, my people. And Assyria, the work of my hand. So we have to touch on what about Assyria could Yahweh, could Jah, Rastafari be pointing to? And what application for our consciousness does it have in our present time? Right? Because this is the fullness verse right here. The work of my hands and Israel, mine inheritance. Now I want to go into verse, I mean, chapter, chapter 20. Because chapter 20 says this right here, verse 3. It's a short chapter, right? Well, let's just go from the very beginning. It says, in the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, we've heard about Sargon, right? The king of Assyria sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it. At the same time spake Yahweh by Isaiah Yeshayahu, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. So the prophet Isaiah was told to take off his sackcloth from his loins, from his backside, and to put off his shoe from his foot, Right, take off your sneakers, and, and you, know, you have to understand something right here. We're being held down, the lost sheep, by this distraction of what we got, what we're wearing. Uh, we're in the latest fashions and styles of Babylon, of the Gentiles, of the Canaanites, and the shoes. Right, what sneakers you wear, and how much they cost. But here, the prophet is told to go and loose this. Right, they're like a Lazarus. It's like Lazarus was called forth. Right? Jah has called us forth, but someone needs to loosen the burial clothes, the burial clothes of the sackcloth and these shoes and sneakers from off thy foot. Right? Get off of their Babylonian name branding, right? And recognize your true name, right? Your true name as Beta Israel, as the house of Israel, as the children of Israel, as Ethiopian Hebrews, and Yeshayahu, Esaias, did so walking naked and barefoot. And Yahweh said, like as my servant, Yeshayahu, Esaias, hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. 
Some have explained this in, in the Western prophetic of the men to, to be Egypt would be the northern states get going down to the capital, D.C., right? And Ethiopia would be the southern states, right? The southern states, you know, what they call the dirty south or, and going to the Caribbean, you understand, in that sense, which is similar to where the rivers meet and where that light first lit right, and shined upon I and I sitting in darkness in ignorance of who we be. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. So at this time, we can see clearly that the Ethiopians, the ancient Ethiopians are part of the ancient Egyptian, right, establishment, right? And they're being now led away. It looks similar to the the the, the um, enslavement pictures of the Hebrews, the Ethiopian Hebrews in the Americas and the Caribbean. And they, verse 5, shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation. Expectation, my people, means hope. Right. Look at now, if you ask a lot of folks, they're like, yeah, back at that time. But now they're, they're ashamed of Ethiopia because of all the pictures on the BBC and the media, of famine and starvation and, the, and Ethiopia, by extension, is Africa and Egypt, their glory, the glory of ancient Egypt. And the inhabitants of this isle shall say in that day, behold, such is our expectation, whither we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria. And how shall we escape? Now, I, I heard an interview, uh, a, a teaching of Dr. Um, John Henry Clark, and he was talking about how, you know, the Rastafari are the more African conscious, but yet we seem to be confused concerning Haile Selassie. I really say the intellectuals like John Henry Clark and Job Bless His Soul, they were somewhat confused about Haile Selassie, but he did speak a good word of truth when he said that among all of those he met in the Caribbean who really were standing for the true struggle, it was the Rastafari. And those that were agreeing with him from, from the intellectual crowd of Jamaica and the, you know, the college people and at the, some of the, um, um, Pan-African Marcus Garvey, uh, um, seminars that he had attended, I think in the nine, in the eighties and nineties, um, it was the Rastafari that agreed with him. <laughs> so you see the disagreement really is about our God and King of Kings. It's, it's a spiritual, see, it's a spiritual warfare. He, on the facts on the ground, we all agree, right? On, on, on he who sits above the storms, here's where's the disagreement is really about. And they turn to Egypt, many of them in the idolatrous, you know, it becomes idolatry because they don't see his majesty. They don't see his son, our black Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. They don't see the black Madonna, the black mother. They talk about ISIS and what was a prophecy, but they don't see the fulfillment. So we have the myth from ancient Egypt, but we have the reality even in our times. And we see this reality even within our black mothers, our own mothers who had the faith, because they did not have the faith, many of us would be in a worse um, situation today. But on the point of Assyria and the Syrian, Clark said that many of the Rastafari claim that Edward Siaga is a Syrian and he laughs it off and says he's a Boston pimp and everything. Well, you know, the, both of those can be true. You see what I'm saying? Both of those actually can be quite true and they're not mutually exclusive. They actually are inclusive. They actually explain one and the next. But I point to that because the sixth verse says, and the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, behold, such is our expectation. They ask whither we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria and how shall we escape, right? In Yas and date. In Amelthalen, in Dayton Amelthalen, like how shall we get away from this? You understand? How shall they come out of 
Egypt. Remember what was said that the highway, the gospel, the good news of our God and Father who says, this is my beloved son, the black Christ, Jesus Christos, right? Jesus Christos as our black Lord and Savior. We have to, we, it's only pride that causes many of us as black men to say, well, we're all gods and everything. And Jesus, yeah, he was a good one, but he was just, you know, so forth and so on, you know, just to dismiss it because it's pride. Because when we say that, well, he's our black Lord and Savior and we put him in his proper perspective, then we are not headless. See, we're headless as long as we think we're gods and still can't pay the rent and can't make sure that the, you know, that the, that the fridge is well stocked and fed and the needs of our woman and children. We're gods. Well, what about it? 